Ladies and gentlemen, uh, His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Japan, Mr. Toshimiki Motegi, has arrived, so please do welcome him. We will throw the applause. so pleased to be able to welcome the Foreign Minister of Japan, Mr. Motegi. And we are so very pleased to be able to welcome the Foreign Minister Motegi to this uh, Tokyo Global Dialogue, uh, which is held in commemoration of the 60th anniversary of the JIIA. I'm sure that he is very, very busy every day, especially in uh, attending to the diet. Uh, but thank you so very much for coming here today. So I do hope that for uh, a few moments you can forget all about the diet and politics and enjoy delivering your foreign policy speech. Uh, Mr. Motegi uh, assumed the office of foreign minister in September of this year, but before that he has been very actively engaged in negotiations of the TPP and the Japan-US trade agreement and other very critical national issues. And today we would like the foreign minister to appear in person to deliver his very first uh, keynote address on foreign policy since his assumption of office. As I'm very much looking forward to his speech. So, Mr. Motegi, please. Let me first of all extend my heartfelt congratulations on the convening of the first Tokyo Global Dialogue today in celebration of the 60th anniversary of the Japan Institute of International Affairs, or JIIA, under the able leadership of Mr. Sasai, President of JIIA. As the international community witnesses the rise of a number of emerging countries, the shift in the global power balance is accelerating and becoming increasingly complex and uncertainty over the existing order is growing. Against this backdrop, the choice of today's theme, is it possible to build an international order based on free, fair, and transparent rules, is extremely timely indeed. I see the recent acceleration of confrontation in the international community in such forms as regional conflicts and trade friction and these developments remind me of the Thucydides these trap proposed by Professor Graham Allison of Harvard University. I was one of his students. Obviously, people's opinions are divided on this concept, and I do not particularly subscribe to historical determinism or the argument that humankind will inevitably repeat struggles for hegemony. However, it's also true that throughout human history, we have gone through many dramatic shifts in the balance of power, such as seen in the uh, Peloponnesian War and the Punic Wars in ancient times, and the battle over maritime hegemony amongst Portugal, Spain, and England in the early modern era. And, of course, the end of the Cold War in the 20th century. So looking back at this history, I reflected on what lessons I can learn from this theory as the person in charge of the foreign policy of Japan, a country that has achieved progress under the blessings of the liberal post-war world order. And after some deliberation, I have come to a set of conclusions about the direction which Japan's foreign policy should aim for. It is precisely because of, because of the current reality where existing great powers and emerging powers are competing for influence that claims must not be asserted by force. Rather, we may need to make an effort to find a solution based on the rules of the international community. At the same time, the international order needs to be made more sustainable 
through the creation of new rules reflecting various changes in the economy, society, and technological innovation. So those are the conclusions that I have reached. So let me first talk about Japan's diplomatic stance to protect and deepen the rules-based international order. To make it easier to understand, I'd like to talk in specifics and give you an example of the rule of law at sea, which is of the utmost geopolitical importance. In 2014, Prime Minister Abe announced the three principles of the rule of law at sea. These were, one, making and clarifying claims based on international law. Second, not allowing the use of force or coercion in trying to change the status quo. And third, seeking to settle disputes by peaceful diplomatic means. Approximately five centuries ago, in the age of uh, exploration, human activities started to become truly global. With this came the development of rules regarding the seas, a new stage for such exploration. However, in many cases, international relations concerning the rule of the sea were actually characterized by clashes between major powers using force, and major powers caught in the uh, Thucydides trap fought over maritime hegemony, and through this process, maritime rules were formed. Finally, in the 20th century, efforts began to codify rules of the sea that would bring common benefits to nations and peacefully settle maritime disputes. The culmination of such efforts can be found in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas, or UNCLOS, which entered into force in 1994. The human race has finally attained a comprehensive and integrated legal system based on principles such as the freedom of navigation. Today, however, the seas, well, this weekend I was in India, but especially the seas in the Indo-Pacific have become the stage for the rapid rise of emerging countries. We must not go back to the era of the struggle for maritime hegemony that has characterized modern history. The most important thing is for every country to raise and share international awareness that their actions should be in compliance with UNCLOS as a comprehensive standard and that disputes should be settled peacefully. Equally important is for us to get those maritime rules to evolve so that new challenges, such as those involving the marine environment, can be addressed and the common interest of mankind can be ensured into the future. Charles Darwin, known for his theory of evolution and for being the author of On the Origin of Species, said that the species that survive are neither the biggest nor the strongest, but rather the ones that are most responsive to change. The government of Japan at various levels, including Prime Minister Abe and myself, and on a number of occasions has been consistently advocating the importance of abiding by and advancing the rules governing the seas and oceans. Japan is also contributing to the further development of the legal order concerning the seas and oceans to effectively address new challenges in fields such as climate change, the marine environment, and marine resources. Through such efforts, Japan is working to make the overall legal order built around UNCLOS even more robust. Another initiative of Japan involves making new rules. Here, I would like to take the example of trade issues. Amidst the recent surge of protectionist tendencies across the world as a reaction to globalization, 
Japan has always been a flag bearer of free trade and has consistently led efforts to create rules for the 21st century that can respond to new economic activities concerning global supply chains, digital economy, etc. The TPP-11 is a prime example of this. In January 2017, when uh, the Trump administration withdrew from the TPP, there was brief apprehension that the TPP would find itself adrift. Japan, however, led the TPP-11 with the firm conviction that it was vital for the 11 countries other than the United States to continue to be united and form an economic sphere based on free and fair trade in the region. Such efforts bore fruit as the TPP-11 was signed in March 2018 and then entered into force at the end of last year. I did attend the signing ceremony there, although the uh, diet was in session, but I was told not to stay over. Uh, so I went to Santiago in Chile on a three, uh, four day, one night visit, a zero night visit. And also on 31st of uh, December, or 30th of December, uh, the uh, TPP-11 entered into force. And through various trade agreements, the government of Japan continues to expand the area where high quality rules are applied. The TPP-11, the Japan-EU Economic Partnership Agreement, and the Japan-US Trade Agreement are act together to form a free economic sphere that covers 60% of the world's GDP. And Japan sits at the very hub of the sphere. Another point is that the global economy is going to become more and more data driven in the future. Rules re regulating free data flow are key to the data driven economy. Whether those rules can be kept free and fair and respond to the overwhelming speed with which ICT technology advances will fundamentally impact our ability to achieve the future growth of the global economy. Japan's leadership in this field led to, in June this year, the Osaka track launched on the sidelines of G20 Osaka Summit. It created growing momentum for international rulemaking, rules making on the data flow and e-commerce. Thereafter, vibrant discussions on advancing the Osaka track have been happening at the multilateral fora such as the WTO and the OECD. At last week's G20 foreign ministers meeting in Nagoya, the ministers agreed to accelerate this effort. At the same time, on the bilateral front, Japan has also demonstrated a standard for digital economic activities to the world by signing an extremely progressive digital trade agreement with the United States. What I would like to stress here is that Japan is not merely pursuing the expansion of a free economic sphere alone. Underlying Japan's approach is a strategic judgment on what a desirable new framework would look like for the Asia-Pacific, the center of the world's growth, uh, from not only an economic but also a geopolitical perspective. Ensuring the U.S. presence in the Asia-Pacific strategic uh, framework is essential. And as a U.S. ally, Japan is assuming the responsibility for making this happen. In this connection, the Japan-U.S. trade agreement, whose diet deliberations are now in their final phase, is going to play the role of anchoring the United States in the free economic sphere of the Asia-Pacific. Furthermore, Japan is making diplomatic efforts to realize the RCEP with the participation of all 16 countries, including India. 
I was actually in India just uh, until last uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the uh, Japan-India uh, 2 plus 2 strategic uh, meeting. Whether we can keep India in the RCEP, we cannot yet tell for certain at this moment. Yet, what is driving our effort is Japan's firm conviction that the framework of the RCEP can truly unleash the region's economic potential only with the participation of India, which is the world's most populous democracy and a major strategic player concerning connecting the Asia-Pacific and the Indian Ocean. then how can we bring actual economic prosperity by increasing every country's potential under such rules? This question leads to my next point about Japan's foreign policy concerning development cooperation, economic cooperation. I believe what underpins freedom and fairness, both building blocks of prosperity, is having a choice. Having a choice. Whether in making personal life choices or making policy choices for a state, a true self-fulfillment becomes possible only when there are options to choose from. Where, the, where there is only one option available, the potential of an individual or of a nation cannot fully bloom. In the business uh, strategy, that uh, a principle applies as well. The same realization underlies Japan's development cooperation. Let us take uh, Japan's efforts to improve connectivity, for example. Japan supports the formation of economic corridors and logistics infrastructures in various regions of the world so that they can advance their economic activities in a multi-layered network of connectivity with a number of options available for the movement of people and goods and without having to be subjected to a single supply chain. Furthermore, Japan's development cooperation is not merely about providing funding, uh, building infrastructures and facilities, but we make a point of taking a long-term view in generating local employment and offering capacity building and human resource development so that our partners can take ownership of their own economic development. In infrastructure, a development project, Japan attaches importance to strengthening the social vibrancy of partner countries by, for example, enhancing resilience against natural disasters and fostering community building. At the Japan ASEAN summit meeting in November, Prime Minister Abe launched an initiative to expand Japan's support in three areas, quality infrastructure development, improving financial access and supporting women, and green investment. Today, following up on that, I have the honor of, to announce that as a concrete measure, Japan aims to mobilize three billion US dollars from the public and private sectors over the next three years between 2020 to 2022, including through a total of 1.2 billion US dollars in overseas loans and investment for ASEAN by JICA. Now, I'm expecting a big applause here. I believe this speaks amply to Japan's policy of providing new economic options and promoting free and fair economic development throughout the ASEAN region. Today, I have talked about Japan's foreign policy in terms of abiding by the rules, formulating new rules, and increasing options. And this is, in fact, the very essence of Japan's vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. 
The Indo-Pacific is the center of the world's dynamism with half of the world's population living here. It is at the same time where the balance of power is increasingly complex with a number of emerging powers on the rise. By now, I hope you have fully grasped that Japan is pursuing a consistent foreign policy from a long-term perspective in the Indo-Pacific in order to build an international order based on free, fair, and transparent rules. Looking at President Sasae, who served as Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs for two years and Ambassador to the United States for six, I am not like him. I've been Foreign Minister for just but a little less than three months. Still, I do have the privilege of sparing no effort every day to advance a world ruled by law, not by force, by building upon Japan's strong international presence that has steadily become more prominent under the long-running stable administration of Prime Minister Abe. At the G20 Aichi Nagoya Foreign Minister's meeting, which I hosted last week, concluding Japan's presidency, I believe that Japan's leadership in resolving global challenges and rules making was enhanced, building on the Osaka track, G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment, and various other outcomes of the G20 Osaka summit. On such a note of confidence, let me conclude my remarks by sharing my response to today's theme. Is it possible to build an international order based on free, fair, and transparent rules? As the man in charge of Japan's diplomacy, my answer to the question is an emphatic yes. Thank you very much for your attention. Prime Minister Motegi, thank you very much. Now then, on behalf of the audience, we would like to ask President Sasae of the JIIA to ask a question to Minister Motegi. I'm sorry, I'm sure the foreign ministers wanted to leave right away to rush to the diet, but thank you very much for a very emphatic, powerful speech. So I have just one question. Now you said that it's quite important to abide by the rules and also to create new rules. But in order to abide by the rules or create new rules, I think that you need some force to ensure that such rules are abided by or new rules are created. And the basis of that force would be uh, values, ways of thinking, and also uh, the ability to appeal those values uh, to the public and also to gain uh, their uh, endorsement. So such soft power-like factors are very important. And if, despite those efforts, such rules uh, were broken or or threatened to be broken, then I think that in the real world, we need some sort of military force to make sure that the rules are abided by. So what do you think about such soft power and hard power? And also, in this context, uh, well, I think uh, the minister also referred to uh, China. Uh, how do you view the battle over hegemony uh, between the United States and China in that context? Thank you very much. A question is something that a person without knowledge asks a person with knowledge. Uh, so when a person with knowledge asks a question to a person without knowledge, that's a test on examination. Now, in order to advance uh, Prime Minister Abe's diplomacy that takes a panoramic perspective of the world map, I need that uh, we need to deploy 
a, a diplomacy that combines a sense of uh, caring and robustness. That is one that uh, respects the uh, diversity of the international society and for Japan to exercise its uh, coordination abilities and to start uh, various rulemaking uh, for the sake of robustness and for Japan to take leadership and take a firm response or attitude to uh, events that may happen. At the G20 foreign ministers meeting, uh, I had the occasion to discuss these matters with various foreign ministers across the world, and I felt the strong expectation that they have of Japan. And one factor uh, that underpins uh, their expectation is the good image, the good global image of Japan, that is uh, the uh, trust in Japan's uh, technologies and its national ethos, uh, the animation and contents industry, and uh, Japanese food and Japanese culture, which is all soft power. However, at the same time, as uh, the security environment surrounding Japan increasingly becomes tough, uh, Japan is also accumulating various necessary efforts uh, to defend itself. For example, the passage of uh, the package of laws related to peace and security, also last year's review of the national defense program guidelines uh, have been implemented quite steadily, and the Japan-US alliance is also becoming even more strong. Now then, how do I view the current situation? When it comes to the U.S.-Chinese relations, of course, uh, trade friction is a major point of interest for not only Japan, but the international society. And I myself am uh, viewing the situation with very strong interest. And I believe that Mr. Li Pen is probably having a very tough time. But the current U.S.-China uh, relations, I think, has not uh, gone to the level of the Thucydides trap, and uh, Japan, under a very firm uh, trust relationship with the United States, and under a totally normalized relationship with China, would like to continue to communicate closely with both countries. And uh, because we live in an age where the existing uh, great powers are competing against the new emerging forces, we should not force through our assertions based on force, uh, but the United States and China together should seek solutions based on uh, the rules of international society. At the same time, we must engage deeper with the United States and with China uh, in the creation of new rules to adapt to that change, uh, that the US and China not only think in their own interests, but to work to create a common foundation for all and to seek the engagement or involvement of both uh, superpowers in this approach, I think is very important. And I believe that is a role that Japan uh, can play. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Motegi, uh, the Foreign Minister of uh, the Government of Japan, thank you very much for uh, sparing time uh, to join us. Because of the public engagement, he has to leave the stage now. Please give him a big round of applause.